toward the end of World War II, there was a, an American a POW camp behind enemy lines in Germany. And at this particular camp, like, like many of the others, the conditions for the American uh, prisoners were, were horrific. They were underfed, uh, thin, cold, uh, you know, starving, discouraged, wondering if they would ever get rescued, uh, wondering if uh, hope would ever come for them, would they ever see their home uh, ever again. The Nazi guards would watch them uh, through their fence, uh, seeing their shoulders slumped, their faces downcast, uh, rarely even seeing the prisoners talk to each other. And then one day, everything changed. Prisoners were still behind the fence, and they were still starving, and they were still cold, and they were still thin, and, and yet the guards noticed that, that they were happy, and they were talking to each other, and they were huddled in these, these little groups, and, and they would actually even hear a cheer uh, occasionally there in, in the camp, and the, the guards were just baffled what was going on, like nothing had changed, and now they were all happy. And what made the difference was a little transistor radio got smuggled into that camp, and those prisoners had heard that the Allies had uh, entered Europe and were uh, conquering and moving and making their way inland, and they, they knew that within a matter of time, they would be uh, rescued, that liberation was happening. So the point of that little story is the power of hope. See, nothing had changed in their situation except hope, because the good news was that rescue was coming. Help was on the way. Now, while we can never call ourselves POWs, I think we do feel like prisoners at times. Right? We look at our situation, our condition in life. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's something going on in your family. It just feels helpless, hopeless. You kind of feel like you're still behind the fence and the gates are locked and, and there's a discouragement that's kind of hovering over you. And yet, like in the story, great news, great news that changes everything. Oh, our circumstances may not change around us, but great news, Jesus is coming back. He is coming, rescue, he's already won the battle. That happened at the first coming, the first advent that we've been talking about all month here in December. That he came not just as a baby, but he came to die to take care of our biggest problem, our sin problem so that we can be forgiven and know God. And so the battle has been won. And because he has won, he is making his way for us. And we're going to be taken with him, if we know Jesus, to heaven. No more bondage, no more evil. All that's messed up in your life and in this world wiped away. And, I mean, think about it. Like, all that you look forward to, all that... That, that is good and that pleases God and that is healthy in every way is going to happen and all that is messed up and, and wrong and evil and corrupt and you name it, wiped out completely. Oh, that's a great day that's coming. Okay, our rescue is coming. And in this Advent series, we've here on this last weekend, we're going to talk about Second Advent. And this is when Jesus will come back and he promised uh, that he would. How do we know he will? He came the first time. If he came the first time, went to that cross, did what he did, we can believe he's going to come back. What we see in the Bible is a lot of things about Jesus, what he was supposed to do that he didn't do during his first coming. Some people even confuse that and said, well, he, he failed. He didn't accomplish all that the Bible says he was supposed to accomplish about being the king of this planet and taking over and, and, and actually reigning over all the nations and righting all wrongs. That didn't happen during his first coming because it wasn't supposed to. It's going to happen during his second coming. I want to talk about that today. And a lot of verses we can grab onto. I've chosen a text out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And um, I love it there in Revelation 22 
where very last chapter, we should, we should review that periodically, how it's, how it's, how it's going to be. And, and Jesus says, with his last words, come three times, I'm coming quickly, I'm coming soon, I'm coming soon, my reward is with me, so be ready, I'm coming. And then John 14, he promised that I go to prepare a place for you in my Father's house are many mansions. I'm making one for you. Don't miss this place because I'm going to bring you back with me. So let's jump into this First Thessalonians text, 11 verses. Actually, it's back up a couple verses in chapter 4. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive are left and left and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Jesus is going to come back. Those who have died before us who are Christians, they're already with the Lord now, but their bodies, they'll get their glorified bodies. It's kind of a super resurrection for them. And then we will join them in the air uh, to be with the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we don't need to write to you, for you know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you as a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. Do not, we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. So, like, I'm wondering if this could be the year. Could this be the year, Jesus? Maybe this will be the year. Man, I sure hope it is. 2020 vision. What kind of vision would that be to see Jesus coming? And you hear that trumpet, and it's not your neighbor practicing next door. It's the trumpet of God. And, man, this this is it. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Here's the big idea that I think is a great summary of the text I just read. Concerning Jesus' return, we don't know when he's coming, but we know that he's coming, and so we live like he's coming. So this big idea gives us an outline for today. Number one, we don't know when he's coming because it says you're about times and dates. We don't need to write to you. Why? Because he's coming like a thief. Nobody knows. See, that's the kind of whole burglary 101. Like, they know when they're coming, but you don't. Like, they don't call, hey, is 2 a.m. okay? Like, (laughs) that's not a good burglar. So, it's going to be a surprise. You don't know when. It's going to, you can't know when. And I wonder why people just don't get this. Like, all throughout church history, there have been these Christians that have like set dates. I think he's going to come back this day and they get all hyped up and sensational about these. And it's just, for example, about the year 1000, Europe was in turmoil and, and, and they're about to hit 1000. They called it Y1K. And, <laughs> and it's like, oh, Jesus is going to come back. And of course he didn't then. And the 1400s, there was widespread plague and famine and people are like, oh, this looks like the book of Revelation. And it wasn't. And and then in the 1800s, that's how the Jehovah's Witness got started, and that's how the Seventh-day Adventists got started, because they started setting dates when Jesus was going to come back, and he didn't. They were wrong. In the 80s, a guy wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Return in 1988. And then when he didn't, he wrote a sequel, 89 Reasons Why the Lord Will Return in 89. That book didn't do as well. Then in 2000, Oh, it's all going to come to an end. The computers are going to stop. Clearly, that's in Revelation somewhere. And then who can forget all the hype over December 21st, 2012? Right? The Mayan, Mayan calendar and, and somehow Jesus is going to... And, you know, it just goes on and on. Like whenever something big happens in our world or an event or catastrophe or some special sign in the sky, you know, we're, we're like, oh, you know, he's coming and... and 
And then, you know, it's like we're trying to take all the current events of today and we're trying to put them into Bible prophecy. And people have been doing that for years and it sells books and it's sensational, but, but we end up looking goofy. Okay, can I say as Christians, we look goofy enough because we love Jesus. But let's not be goofy for the wrong reasons, like setting these crazy dates. Because Jesus says the one thing you know for sure is that you can't know for sure when. But we know, number two, that he's coming. Paul calls it the day of the Lord in verse 2. He doesn't make this up. It's uh, really, it comes, goes way back into ancient Old Testament uh, prophecy. The day of the Lord is that day he returns to bring justice and to bring judgment. Because this evil needs to be addressed, all evil in our world needs to be addressed, and God is going to do that. There'll come a day when his patience ends and he's going to deal with this okay let's stop right here because i know whenever we talk about judgment and god's justice it, you know people recoil it's like I don't, I don't like that justice judgment thing you all can talk about it i don't want to talk about it i don't like it he's not going to judge me he's not going to judge anybody now i was thinking about that and there is because I, I get that it's not easy to talk about this kind of this aspect of god's character but here's the deal there is something worse than God's judgment. No judgment, right? No accountability that God's not going to do anything. Like, how could you even believe in a God like that? He's not going to do anything about any of this stuff. He's just going to let this go undealt with, unaccountable. That's a more terrifying prospect. No, we, we see, evil's a parasite, and it needs to be addressed, and we cry out for justice. This is why, this is why a lot of us like Western movies, Right, because there's a town and there's just bad guys that are like oppressing the town, until a uh, a tougher guy comes, but he's a good guy, and he deals with it. And let me tell you something: when justice and evil collide, it gets scary. But it needs to happen if the town's going to be delivered. Same with this world: that when God's justice comes and to deal with evil, yeah, it's messy, it's scary, but it needs to happen. This is our story. We we long for this. More importantly, this is God's story. And there'll come a day he will right all wrongs. People might say, how can God allow all this stuff going on? Well, basically, we've made a mess of it, and he is going to deal with it. And people are, verse 3, they're saying, oh, peace and safety. It's like, it's all good. I got money, and I got my life, and I got my plans. It's all good. And destruction will come on them. Paul's like, Hey, it's going to go badly for them. The Old Testament prophets would say, uh, you're you're following false gods. You're not really serving the Lord. You're doing your own thing. And God's going to right all wrongs. And those people who think that are going to be in trouble. And you don't have to. You can surrender to the Lord and follow the Lord. 2 Peter 3, Peter puts it this way, above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised, ever since our ancestors died? Everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Anyone ever said that to you? You Christians, you've been believing, you've been talking like this for 2,000 years, that Jesus is coming back. He hasn't, he's not coming. Now, next time someone says that to you, you can say, hey, you know what? You're in the Bible. You're right here. It's predicted that people like you are going to say stuff like this. Actually, be nice about it, okay? You be like, be super nice about it. But, but the Bible predicts this stuff, that there'll be scoffers, but they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear at the roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. So people, they're going to say, day of the Lord, God's judgment, that's a joke. And they've forgotten something. What they've forgotten is that God destroyed the world the first time. Okay. There's proof all around us to show about that worldwide flood. And he's going to do it again. 
And there'll be people, and it says really what they're, what they're about is they're in the darkness. There's two groups. Everybody's in one of the two groups, light or darkness. And darkness simply means separated from God, ignorance, immorality. And light means we know the truth, we can see, we have a relationship with God. We just want to make sure we're people of light who, who have hearts that are forgiven, that we're saved and we're set free and we're walking with the Lord to be, to be in the light. Because we've been, Colossians 1.13, rescued from darkness and put into the light. That's a great verse. So make sure that we're dwelling in this relationship with the Lord. But if you're like, I don't need God, I don't want God, the Bible says you're in the darkness. And what's going to happen is it's going to come on you like a, like a surprise. We don't want that for any of you here. I hope we're all in the light, sins forgiven, relationship with Christ Waiting, anticipating that great return of his. And they use this analogy, labor pains. Uh, Paul uses it, Jesus uses it, Matthew 24. And, and that's a good analogy because it, it's like we don't know exactly when that baby's coming, but we kind of know that he or she's coming, right? And, and then you, you're, you're, you're ready for that. You're thinking uh, about that you have a plan in place type thing. Like, like you know that's a reality that's happening, even though you don't know exactly when and in Matthew 24, Jesus give, gives some specific labor pains, things we can be looking for that are signs that his coming is near. There's a lot of stuff there you can study it on your own: wars and famines, and and uh, uh, false religion, and a lot of these these labor pains. Uh, but then there's some labor pains that really are only happening now. Like they they're unique to our day. So it's just gets my attention that we're seeing labor pains that are happening now that weren't necessarily happening when Jesus said them. And so, like, you know, she, like the, the tummy's getting bigger, let's put it that way. And we're getting closer. Things like gospel expansion. The gospel is now out all over the world, not like it should be yet, but it's way, way more than before. And the Bible translated in different languages. That's unique to today. Uh, Population exp- expansion, that's unique for today. The Bible predicts that. The Bible talks about technology, exponential kind of explosion stuff. That's happening today like never before. Geopolitical things that are happening, especially in the Middle East concerning Israel and for everybody else. Again, unique to today. So all these things, to me at least, I'm going, man, this, is, this appears like I'm not going to go set dates or get all weird but this looks like it's getting closer. So, we don't know when, but we know that. Number three, so we live like he's coming. Let us not be like others who are asleep. Let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. It's talking about just living in the darkness. Doesn't mean like sleeping literally, but just like they just live their life on their own completely, not even thinking about God, not caring about God, thinking it's all about them, thinking it's all just about this life. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, put it on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. So Paul's saying since we know that Jesus is coming, our lives should look like it. Like the way we do money, the way we do relationships, the, the way we do sexuality and family and marriage, all of that based on the fact that Jesus is real, that he's coming back. It should influence how we live. We are, by God's grace, we're different in a, in a, in a, in a, in a blessed kind of a way. The decisions that we make, it changes everything when you know that Jesus is coming soon. It should at least. I was reflecting on my own life, and I'm just going to confess to you, Shame to admit this, how often I can go and not even thinking about Jesus' return. And I'm missing awesome motivation for my life. And purifying, there's a, there's a, look, if you know Jesus is going to like come right now, it's going to affect what you're doing, right? There'll come a day when he does come right now. And I hope that you're the kind of person you want to be found faithful in serving the Lord. Not found ashamed, not found, oh, I was doing that when Jesus came. That doesn't mean you're going to go to hell. If you're saved, you're saved. But who wants to go to heaven in the middle of some stupid, sinful situation? I don't. I want want to be preaching and just drop over dead or have Jesus return, right? 
I have friends that happen to. I want to be like loving the Lord and following the Lord and giving to the Lord and serving the Lord when he comes back. That's the idea, to keep him on our thoughts and on our heart all the time. It's this anxious sort of anticipation. There was this TV show a few years back. Um, I think the name of it was Early Edition. Early Edition. And it was about this guy, and he would get the Early Edition, a prophetic newspaper, one day early. So he knew he could see what was actually going to happen the next day. And then he would live in such a way to try to change things and to make a difference. I'm like, that's a great illustration. Friends, we have the early edition. We know how this thing's going to go down, maybe not specifically, but generally speaking, like we know what's up and it should make a difference by how we live our life. As Peter says in 2 Peter 3, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You got to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. I like that. Speed its coming. Oh, today, please, God, come back. I want to be with you. I'm looking forward to this. I want my life to make a difference for you. Some of you, you're living like this isn't going to happen. You're living like he's not going to come back. It's easy to forget about this. Guys, not forgetting, anticipating. Having a life that is different because of Jesus and his uh, eventual return. Could be any day. And he says, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So it's talking about this reality of a destruction. Great big bonfire. It's kind of how I see it. All that stuff. Let me give you a reality check. All that stuff that we think is so important, homes, cars, cell phones, gadgets, jewelry, sporting goods, you name it, all this Christmas gifts, all that. Like, I'm not saying it's bad stuff, but it's going to fry. It's going to burn. Think about that. No, it's not that it's bad. It's just it doesn't matter. Up against people, up against our relationship with the Lord, we think our life kind of revolves around all this stuff. It's like, what? The reminder here, big bonfire. That's the reminder of how important that stuff is. So he says, what does matter is like next, next scripture, he says the, the breastplate of, of love and faith along with the helmet of salvation so, so those are the, those are the, he's, it's a warfare metaphor. He's shifted to a warfare metaphor. Not that we're, we're not fighting government. We're not fighting people. We're fighting with the weapons of love and faith. I love that faith. That's why we're called believers. We're fighting with that weapon that we believe. We believe God. We believe God in his character. We believe he's going to come through. We believe he did what he did. We believe he's coming back. We believe. That's why we're believers. We also are people of love. Why can we be people of love? Because love lives in us. It's not my love. I don't got any. Okay? It's the love of God. Why can we be people of love? Because we're set. Sin's forgiven. We're set free. Our future's set. So now I don't have to worry. It's not about looking out for me. Okay? I got it taken care of because I've got all that I need. I got this pastor friend in town. Every time I, I see him, hey, how you doing? He's this pastor's a small church in this town. Hey, how you doing? And he's like, I'm forgiven and I'm going to heaven. Big old smile on his face. I just love the simplicity, but the power of that. You know what he's saying? He said, I'm set. It's all good. What else is there to worry about or to hope that I get in my life? I'm forgiven and I'm going to heaven. And that's why it says here, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So there it is again right there. Like because we're in the light and because of the precious, beautiful salvation and forgiveness of Jesus, we're not under God's wrath anymore. That wrath was taken out on Jesus, who is our covering, 
who's the Lamb of God who offers us that forgiveness that we receive by faith. So when that happens, we're not under that wrath anymore. A lot of other people are, and so our concern should be, how can I help save you out of that? Which, by the way, makes vengeance for the Christian so foolish. It's almost idiotic that we think that vengeance is important to, to dish out to somebody. Isn't God's vengeance enough? Like they're under God's authority and justice. Let's just leave it with God. Our heart should be, I hope they know grace. I hope they're in the family that I'm in. I want them to be forgiven. Can't, can't be responsible for that, but that's, you know, that's, that's my heart. So encourage one another. It bookends, right? It was a bookend. It starts with encourage one another. It ends with encourage one another. That should get our attention. Like, this is what we should be talking about. This is why we have, like, groups, like life groups. So we encourage one. See, some of you think maybe you're not a part of one because you don't think, it, you, don't think you need it. You don't want to be. You know what? We're missing out on you. We're missing out on you. I need. Every time I go to a group, I get encouraged by somebody else usually more than one. And things like, hey, hang in there, man. Hey, don't quit. Keep going. Yeah, that, that sucks. That's terrible what happened to you. Last. But you know what? Don't stop. Jesus is coming back. It's like that bumper sticker. Jesus is coming soon. Look busy. <laughs> you know? I don't like that completely, but there's part of it I love. Jesus is coming soon. Look busy. And to encourage one another, hey, you know what? You're going to see your loved one again. Some of you lost loved ones this, this last year. And that day, if they know the Lord, you're going to see them again. And, I mean, I think about my brother, my dad. I can't wait to see him again. And, and, you know, our bodies that are falling apart. You know, it's just like, I'm looking forward to a new body. No more pain, no more sin, no more, like, you know, <laughs> creaky knees and stuff and backache and headaches and more physical therapy, my buddy over here. God's got that taken care of, brand new bodies. How cool. And then inside of us, have even started in on some of the things within, my own heart, just can't seem to get victory over, trying, praying, trusting. But there's always those continual challenges. I'm looking forward to that day where that battle's over. And just be with him. So as we talk about encouraging each other with, with, with this kind of stuff, no more broken anything. New heaven, new earth. So when we're thinking about Jesus' return, every day can be a good day because, like, what's better than that? I'm not trying to minimize things that happen around us or pain inflicted upon us, but... But hang on. Hope's coming. So, one of the greatest stories that I think I've heard about a rescue other than Jesus himself, and a man who promised that he would return, took place in 1914, and there was a guy named Ernest Shackleton. He was a famous ship uh, captain and an explorer. And Shackleton set out with 28 men on a ship called the Endurance. This man, everyone called him the boss. He was quite a leader. And his goal was to land on Antarctica and to be the first to cross it. They'd use sled dogs and they would go like 1,800 miles across Antarctica. Tragedy struck before he reached Antarctica, and his ship got lodged in ice, heavy, heavy ice, that basically just closed in on his ship. For 10 months, they were stuck. Can you imagine that? 10 months out on the ice of Antarctica. Like one hour would be enough for me. Then the ice crushed his ship, and the ship sank. Then what do you do? Well, they took their three lifeboats with ropes, and they pulled them to the open sea. It took them five months. Can you imagine pulling big lifeboats across the ice of Antarctica for five months? 
cold, starving, frostbitten, but they knew they had to press on. They finally reached the sea, and they got in these three lifeboats, and they, they, they took about a week, but they made it to this little island called Elephant Island. It's a little rock, basically, there in the Antarctica area. And, and there they knew they would never get rescued because nobody ever go, no ships come close to that. So Shackleton knew he needed to continue on. And so he kept his men there. And they, they built like this little hut out of rocks and put the two lifeboats kind of on the top as cover. And there they waited as Shackleton left, took five of his men and a lifeboat and went 800 miles to another larger island called South Georgia. He knew there was a whaling village there. And so they, it took them a week, and they just got pounded. You can imagine how they even made it was a miracle. But they made it to this island only to realize they were on the wrong side of the island. And to get to the Whaler Village, they actually had to hike 26 miles over glaciers, poorly equipped. Like, that's a huge feat today with mountaineering gear and technology. They did it back then with terrible clothes, with no gear, 26 miles, and they finally stumbled into this whaling village. What a sight they were. And Shackleton, true to his word, put a ship and a crew together, and he went back to save his men. And three times he was turned away because the ice was too thick. He couldn't get his boat in to Elephant Island. Finally, there was an opening, and he got his boat in. And when he came in, it was amazing because his men were ready they were packed up, they were ready to go. They jumped in that boat, turned it around, headed back out to ice. And it was actually just a 30-minute window where the ice opened and closed. And he got his men out of there. And all of them, all 28, 105 days, were rescued and saved as they eventually made it back to England. 105 days on that island. Shackleton later asked his men, how did it happen that you were all packed and ready to go? Like, I, I was shocked. You were standing there on the shore. You were ready to leave at a moment's notice. His second in command said this, every day we would send a watchman up on the mountain to look for your ship and the smoke. We never gave up hope that you would come back for us. Whenever the sea was partly clear of ice, we got all of our gear together and packed things up saying, the boss may come today. And he did, true to his word. I love that story. And I love the greater story that it points to, that our boss is coming back like he promised. And he's going to take us to be with him. And just like Shackleton was their only hope, humanly speaking, so the Lord Jesus is our only hope to save us from this life, to change everything that's messed up in this world, to bring a new heaven and a new earth. Let's thank him and let's pray together. So God, we do love you and we praise you for all you are and all that you've done. We see in your plan that your plan includes a reckoning, a judgment. You're coming back. We don't know when, but we know that you are. I pray we'd live like it. First of all, God, I pray everybody here would be forgiven, having forgiveness of sin and a relationship with you. If you're here and you don't have that settled, you can take care of that right now. Say, Jesus, save me, forgive me, come into my heart. I need you as my Savior. Take all that is sinful in my life and forgive me, please. The Bible says all who call upon Jesus will be saved. And if you just prayed that, I want to encourage you to let somebody know or take that connect card in front of you, check the box. So today, I trusted Christ as my Savior. And for, for all of us, as we think about this new year in front of us, and it's a great time to rededicate, recommit ourselves. Perhaps you've been a Christian for a long, long time, but maybe you feel like you've been kind of asleep or... Kind of just doing your own thing and not realizing that Jesus can come back anytime. So we think about what this means in serving the Lord, being involved, volunteering, giving to the Lord. We think about you know what this means as far as 
You know, people who are in fellowship and encouraging one another as you command. God, we did. We want to say we dedicate our lives to you again for this new year. And we pray you would come back. But until you do, may our lives be found faithful, looking for the boss to return. We know you are. We look forward to seeing you and being with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.